Dr. Stacy, Dr. Sumpha, Dr. Rabbit, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure and honor for me to be at this conference and also in Hong Kong, a place, I think, which has proven that economic freedom is the bedrock that brings about prosperity. And I especially pleased that the theme of the conference this year, which is the populist challenge to economic freedom, is very timely and relevant. Timely because I think as we look around the world, we see a number of conditions that are giving rise to more and more populism in a number of political systems. And relevant because we also begin to see the damaging effects of that populism on the economy and also on the political system themselves. But first let me remind ourselves why we are here and why we remain committed to the idea that individual freedom provides the best and strongest foundations for prosperity and peace. For economists here, I think that uh, the history of the world has proven that individual choice and good management of the economy is the strongest path to prosperity for everybody. For those of us that are politicians here, especially those of us who are liberal Democrats, we remain firmly rooted in our faith and belief that individual choice and freedom is also the best way to determine an individual's and also their society's futures. But the populist challenge to economic freedom, and I should add to liberal democracy, is becoming very real. And we need to identify the conditions that give rise to populism, the effects of populism, and how best we may try to combat populism. Obviously, I don't have all the answers. I'm not sure if anybody in this room has the answer to this very challenge. I thank uh, Dr. Allen for very kind words that he has uh, said about my government. But they are also the very reason why we are no longer in government. So we need to really get to grips with why populism is becoming a very dominant force in a number of political systems around the world. And if we look at the history of populism, maybe by passing the early days of American populism, back in the 19th century, but more on the 20th century, where I think the word populism becomes widely known in the Amer Latin American context. We see very clearly that the golden age of populism usually coincides with economic problems or crisis, and also an economic structure that leads to inequality. The rise of populism we see very clearly, first of all, after the Great Depression, and then again, maybe in the 90s, 80s and 90s, where countries were beginning to experience problems as they were unable to control the damaging effects from perhaps an excessively deregulated or liberalized uh, economic regimes. We need to uh, consider these facts very seriously because I believe that these conditions will become more and more common. Partly because the global economy is likely to go through more and more volatile periods. That is now the nature of a globalized economic system. And this volatility often leads to crises, financial, economic, and then often leading to social and political crises around the world. And when there is discontent, when people are suffering, from economic downturns or depressions, they look for quick fixes, they look for simple solutions. At the same time, we have to recognize also that the current economic structure, particularly the way the market system works, is going to reward winners, is going to lead to a number of losers at a particular time. This leads to inequality, this leads to discontent, and this leads to people who are opportunistic at the political um, leadership level to exploit such discontent. And it's always easy to whip up sentiments that people are not doing well 
because others are actually doing well at their expense. This is why we begin to see the rise of populism again. And we should recognize that in the past, populism and populist trends have cut across ideologies. They could be left-wing, right-wing, or uh, they could happen in developed countries, developing countries. They could uh, arise in democracies, as well as authoritarian regimes. Usually, as I said, because we have an opportunistic political leader who appeals to emotions, who plays on the feeling of discontent arising from economic hardship or economic inequality. And I think the problems today are compounded by the fact that the ICT revolution, the information and communications technological revolution, has changed the way people live. We have far less time for deliberation. People are bombarded with information every day. So it is extremely difficult to start a meaningful political dialogue in terms of policy formulation. Political competition gets reduced to very simple slogans with quick fixes appealing to voters' aspirations. And this has been made more difficult by the fact that modern political campaigns are also very much dominated by people who are experts at marketing and also professional strategists or consultants that would recommend policies that win the elections rather than policies that would deliver longer term prosperity. The experience of Thailand uh, certainly fits into this analysis. For a long time in Southeast Asia, this region was seen as a model in terms of economic development. When Latin America were going through crisis due to the excesses of populism, this region was seen as a region that has discipline fiscally and monetary discipline, as well as the ability to obtain high growth with stability. But the 97 crisis, that uh, affected Thailand, Indonesia, and Korea first, and then the region as a whole, changed the political game, certainly in Thailand. A populist leader basically took advantage of exploited the suffering that people went through during that financial crisis and began to offer excessive populist policies, thereby obtaining popularity and was able to remain in power for a considerable period of time. The political dialogues that used to take place changed in nature. And as, the, as we mentioned during the last election, the campaign basically deteriorated into situations of simple slogans and parties now trying to outbid each other in terms of coming up with populist policies. People do not yet see potential damage that this would do. It does take some time before the, the populist policies work through and lead to the kind of damages that many of us here recognize and can see ahead of time. First of all, it will take some time to undo some of the strong foundations as far as the fiscal and monetary situation is concerned. Thailand, for instance, we are now running budget deficits, the government will be undertaking a number of uh, special uh, borrowing uh, from uh, external as well as internal sources, but it will be some time before the fiscal or monetary situation deteriorate considerably to lead to perhaps another uh, economic or financial crisis. But if we look at history, we see clearly how big the damage is in Latin America, for instance, Argentina used to rank sixth as far as uh, GDP or the size of the economy is concerned. But after several rounds of populist policies, the country found itself ranked 88th. Moreover, despite the appeal to poor and disadvantaged people, populist policies in the past, in all other places, 
have proven not to actually provide solutions for those very people. Rather, the poor become even more dependent on the state, which finds itself unable to deliver the promises that it has made. And it also leads to other uh, damages in the political system. Populism and populist policies usually also come with opportunities for corruption because of excessive state intervention. And the culture of dependency that it creates also destroys the very concepts of individual choice and freedom, which must be the strongest foundations for a liberal democracy and a good functioning market system. Worst of all, populist policies are also associated with increasing social conflicts. As groups of people are pitted against one another for political purposes, and this could even lead to political violence. For Thailand, we are now extremely concerned with what the government is doing in terms of its pursuit of populist policies. Apart from what I now call the infamous rice scheme, which becomes uh, better and better known around the world, we also have a, a number of uh, populist policies also currently at work. By the end of this year, the minimum wage might see a doubling of its rate in some provinces in Thailand. We also have a scheme for first car buyers. We have schemes for uh, uh, the number of funds that are being set up that uh, gives out loans, mostly made, uh, made even for consumption in, uh, in the country. And uh, the damages that we begin to see uh, are becoming uh, clearer and clearer, but perhaps not for the people who directly benefit from these policies at first. Gia, who is uh, here with me, uh, will probably talk a lot more about the rice scheme. But basically a policy that is buying up rice from farmers at roughly about 20 to 30 percent above market price means that uh, the government becomes the sole trader of rice. Already it is expected that Thailand will lose our status as a number one exporter of rice this year because the government is holding all the stock of rice at prices that are far above the market price and therefore it cannot export the rice successfully. <laughs> We're also seeing um, quite a considerable burden being placed on government banks that are running this scheme and will eventually be fiscalized, uh, causing about uh, 100 billion baht of uh, taxpayers' money every year. We also see rampant corruption taking place as uh, state agencies are involved from the stages of buying rice from farmers to actually managing that stock, as well as actually eventually selling those rice uh, at a loss. And yet, uh, the government is continuing with its policy. It is whipping up sentiments of farmers saying that anybody who opposes these policies are basically trying to keep farmers poor, which will eventually lead to even more conflicts in a political environment in Thailand that uh, you already know have been, uh, have been set back by severe political conflict over the last few years. And uh, as we look at these trends, and we look at the past, we see the clear dangers of how this might end. If you look at the experience, whether in Latin America, whether in Europe, or other regions of the world that have gone through these populist phases, we can see at least three types of very unhappy endings. First, for many countries, this leads to the loss of democracy or liberal democracy. First of all, governments that run populist policies become more and more authoritarian as they control more and more of the resources of the country and also try to silence the opposition. And then eventually, uh, when this becomes more and more severe, there is a strong backlash or reaction. And this has led in a number of countries to coup d'etats, military intervention, which then come in to try to fix the problem fair or better at managing the economy, return the countries 
two elections and then to populist regimes. You see these kinds of cycles in a number of regimes around the world. A second type, I guess, of an unhappy ending basically requires some kind of foreign intervention. When the economy can no longer, no longer sustain itself, maybe the IMF, that's called. For countries in Europe now that have, uh, are now suffering from past excesses, it's the European Union that will have to be dictating their economic policies. And it could be argued that in Latin American or Central American, even some North American country, the populist trend had to be stopped by maybe uh, an intervention from a superpower, maybe not explicitly, but also certainly they played an important role in trying to contain uh, the populist trends. But uh, a third unhappy ending, of course, is the collapse of the economy itself. Loss of opportunities and prosperity, loss of competitiveness, and worst of all, the, dis the destruction of the aspirations and hopes that the people whom these populist policies were meant to serve uh, themselves. Can we avoid these unhappy uh, endings? That is the real challenge for all of us here who believe in economic freedom and who believe in liberal democracy. I, I said at the beginning that I don't have the answers, but I do think that there are some vital ingredients that must be put in place to fight populism and to try to get our political systems and countries back on track. First of all, I think we need to recognize that the free market itself, despite its ability of bringing about growth and prosperity in general, cannot be left to itself. It may have the answers about efficiency and growth, but it does not have the answer on the question of distribution. And with a, an increasingly volatile nature, the economic system. We need to put in place good safety nets and provide for this advantage. Not basically just handing out things, but prepare them, retrain them, so that they can become more productive, that they can somehow overcome their immediate economic sufferings. The provision of those opportunities the provision of that safety net will at least protect them or provide some kind of immunity from the temptation of, of their support for quick fixes and populist policies. Secondly, we have to make sure that the process of deliberation remains an important part of any political system. If we allow just quick fixes, attractive slogans, and marketing tactics to be the dominant force as far as political dialogue and policy formulation is concerned. There is no way that you can beat populist parties and populist regimes. Somehow, we need to campaign for more education, public education if you like, on the need for deliberation to get good policies, for sustained prosperity for everybody. And we need to have people think in terms of realistic choices. That the quick fixes and the attractive slogans and the promises that they make somehow need to be financed. Somehow we have to find resources from somebody, and that's usually all taxpayers, all the people to make sure that they can be sustained. We need perhaps the, a movement, the kind of, uh, I'm thinking of in terms of some kind of coalition of taxpayers who make noises about these populist policies because usually the people who benefit immediately from these policies can be very vocal. But the ones that are damaged, basically everybody, especially taxpayers, are usually silent or unaware of effects or the longer term effects of these policies. They need to be brought into the political dialogue and therefore 
society will have a meaningful debate as to how we deal with this. Because after all, for political parties, I know many of you will be asking for politicians to be more responsible. But during elections, we often get asked, do you want to be responsible or do you want to win? And the temptation is always too strong for too many of us uh, to respond by saying that well, we need to win first and then we'll try to be responsible later. We need to make sure that the environment, the political and social environment that we create will put pressure on politicians to be responsible rather than to create an environment whereby politicians feel that they can win by being irresponsible. So that is the basic challenge for all of us, that somehow we should work towards an environment that would be conducive to responsible policy formulation and policy making, which will make sure that our democracies remain relevant, vibrant, and also deliver peace and prosperity, which are the beliefs that I think all of us share in this world. So I hope that this conference so many distinguished participants from so many countries will share our experience and will begin to work on what I see as a very important task, not just for retaining economic freedom in places that already have it, but also in making sure that the many emerging economies and many emerging democracies will not need to go down the path of populism that will eventually destroy freedom and liberal democracy and therefore defeat the purpose of what we will be fighting for. So, thank you very much.